before we can come back. I think. Ma'am, Dr. Vijay Vaskar ready. Ma'am, Dr. Vijay Vaskar ready was also our member, ma'am. No, no, he, the, no, 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 I couldn't get it in a website. Uh, that Haran, I didn't get it. Ma'am, I have sent you at 518 the, his uh, uh, IPM membership number, live membership okay, number. So I tried I calling you, I tried calling you, but your phone was not available, ma'am. Okay, so, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. His third name will also be included in this condolence. And uh, then we can proceed further. As we all know, today's topic is very interesting, basic topic. I think all the PGs and every pathologist have to deal with uh, in their day-to-day -day practice or in their teaching. And we have both the joint cinematology as a moderator, as a speaker. Dr. T. Singh is there. So now I hand over to Dr. D. K. Mishra to introduce, although he doesn't need any introduction, but as a formality, Dr. D. K. Mishra, We'll introduce Dr. T. Singh and then we can start. Very, with very, very good evening to everybody. And I thank uh, Professor Vatsala Mishra and uh, Dr. Uh, Akrantika uh, who have put this in place. And uh, I think this has been a very successful program from the IAPM side to educate and teach our postgraduate students. Today's talk is uh, very important, and I think everybody is looking forward to that. Uh, just to, uh, before I introduce Professor Tejinda Singh, uh, in any uh, national, international CME in hematology in the country, any national conference, any update, any uh, symposia on hematology is incomplete without Professor Tejinda Singh's presence. And he has been a, a, a joint, a colossus in hematology in this country, and he has been teaching hematology for the past almost half a century to his students. Uh, to briefly introduce Professor Tejinder Singh, who needs no introduction, and I revere and uh, I respect him from the bottom and core of my heart. I have been interacting with him for the last almost 35 years now, and I have seen him how he has nurtured people uh, in the field of hematology. He has been a former president of the IAPM of this August body. He has been a former president of the Indian Society of Hematology and Transfusion Medicine as well. He has been a fellow of the Indian College of Pathology, Indian Society of Hematology, authored numerous books, seven books in hematology. And his books are also very popular. There are atlases. And he has painstakingly uh, edited them and he has painstakingly authored them. And it is uh, it is a prized possession of most of the undergraduates and postgraduates in pathology, hematology, and in other areas. Formerly, he was the professor and head of pathology at the prestigious Moronajas Medical College in Delhi. And following that, uh, his superannuation from MAMC, he has been a senior consultant and head of hematology and hematopathology at the Onquest Laboratories, uh, which is also a prominent lab primarily in uh, image oncology in the city of Delhi. And uh, in addition to his professional work in the laboratory that he's working for, he is also active in the teaching circuit and he never says no to anybody's invitation if he is invited to deliver a talk in hematology. And his, his pet talk is bone marrow aspiration and bone marrow biopsy examination in hematological and non-hematological uh, malignancies and disorders. Uh, he has divided his talk into two parts. Today is part one, and without wasting much time and coming between you and Professor Tejinder Singh, I would, like, uh, I would like to now request Professor Tejinder Singh to take over and give his erudition uh, on this subject. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mishra, for your uh, kind words. It has been a pleasure to be part of IAPM, and I'm privileged for uh, you being the moderator. And uh, all the members of IAPM and our residents are very well aware of the contributions being made by you at Tata Center, Calcutta. And we know how many of them are now getting fellowships 
and that continuing uh, medical program. Uh, uh, I am uh, sharing the screen. Uh, hmm? Right. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, is the screen visible? Yes. And yes. Oh. Yes, very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll start where Dr. Mishra left uh, in his <laughs> last. First, uh, he talked about the petrol smears and various uh, cases which he showed and represented how peripheral smear can be useful in diagnosis of uh, hematological disorders. And uh, he had mentioned that how we need the bone marrow aspirate and biopsy in some of the cases to make a diagnosis. So after the peripheral smear, we always go for bone marrow aspirate and or uh, both the things biopsy. Now, bone marrow examination is the gold standard investigation for diagnosis, not only diagnosis, but also for monitoring of many of the hematological disorders and various non-hematological diseases as well. Advantage of the bone marrow aspirate is that it gives beautiful cytological details and one can make out the distinction between blast cells, promyelocytes, myelocytes, intermediate and early erythroblasts and so on. On the other hand, the bone marrow biopsy gives us the organization of the bone marrow, whether the topography of the various cells is maintained or not. And the disturbance of the architecture of the bone marrow <clears throat> gives us an idea that there is some problem uh, in these uh, cases. But we should always examine bone marrow aspirate and biopsy along with the clinical details, peripheral smear, and whatever biochemical findings are available. Now, the various sites where from we get the bone marrow aspirate and our biopsies are anterior superior ilex spine, posterior superior ilex spine. Now, what we are showing here is a posterior superior ilex spine because this is the part where it is a very thick part. It is roughly about 3.5 into 3.5 centimeters. And therefore, it is very easy to take a biopsy at least 2 to 2.5 centimeters long. At the same time, one can do the bone marrow aspirate. Then under radiologic guidance, we can take the bone marrow aspirate and or biopsy. But in infants, we always prefer tubular, tibial tuberosity. Now here I'm showing three needles. Uh, the left one is a bone marrow biopsy needle, which is available at Ludhiana or Ambala. These are not good needles, so should not be used. Then we have in the middle with a blue handle, this is the disposable Jamshidi needle. And on the right is non-disposable or all steel needle, which one can autoclave again and again, and it can be used. Now coming to the middle needle, that is a Jamshidi needle. And the other one also, I want you to have a look at the edge of the needle. You will find that edge is the smallest bore, and then you find the bore keeps on increasing for about three centimeters, and then it is of a uniform bore. Now, this is a grammatic, uh, this is a diagrammatic representation. You find that this part of the needle is narrow. The idea is that as we cut the posterior superior ilex spine, the bone marrow along with the bony trabeculae is going into this. If it is of a uniform bore, the biopsy gets compressed from both the sides. And if it is compressed from both the sides, we are not able to make out the morphology. Hence, we should always be using a Jamshidi needle, all steel or a disposable needle. Disposable needles, of course, are better for uh, sterile purposes. Another thing we have to keep in mind is that once we have done the biopsy, the biopsy should not be pushed as I'm showing here. This is the wrong way to push the bone marrow biopsy because as I showed you that this, the lowest part of the needle for about three centimeters is gradually, uh, this is the narrowest part at the bottom 
and then it is gradually opening up if we push it from this side what is going to happen is the there is compression of the marrow complete and this is what the picture comes when we process the biopsy and examine under the microscope and this is what it looks like we cannot make out the morphology and this is what we call as a crush artifact which is seen and all the cells get compressed everything looks as if there is leukemia so what is the right way to push the bone marrow biopsy out this is the right way because this part is the narrower so we push with a probe and you find that the near the biopsy comes onto the glass slide now once it comes to the glass slide what we do is we roll it between <clears throat> two slides as a result of is the imprint or the touch preparation of the biopsy is taken on this glass slide because at the all around this biopsy there is some marrow which is sticking and this marrow is undiluted so what we get is this is how we roll and what we find is that these imprint smears or the touch preparations of the biopsy are made now this is on gross after jeebs are staining and this is what we see this is uh, under the microscope a scanner view we find that the aspirate is one cell thick the morphology of the cells can be very well made out such smears can be used for cytochemistry also so the touch preparations give as much information as a bone marrow aspirate and that too without dilution so every biopsy should be made and we should take the imprint smears first we always take the biopsy and then we take an aspirate about 1 to 1.5 cm away from the site where from we had taken the biopsy and we put in the needle after adjusting the guard and then we apply the suction as soon as the marrow comes into the hub of the syringe we stop it because whatever marrow has come into this part is sufficient for us for the diagnostic purposes and that is what we do and we make the smears we tilt the uh, whatever aspirate we have got we pour it on the slide and tilt it by 1 or 2 cm so what happens is that because of the tilting the blood if present in this marrow it goes to the bottom and what is left are these marrow fragments you can see these marrow fragments and then we make the smears of these marrow fragments you can see these marrow fragments and these are seen similarly when uh, sometimes we make the smears with a cover slip and then we get all these are marrow fragments that is what we need we need the marrow fragments and at the same time what we need is that the trails of these fragments like these are the fragments and the trails because that is where the morphology of the cells is very well made out and we can easily carry out the differential count now whenever we are doing a bone marrow aspirate or biopsy or both of them we'll find that there are clots which are sticking to the needle to the uh, to the slides so we pick up all the blood clots and we process it as any other tissue so what we find is that even in the blood clot there are some marrow fragments which are lying and sometimes we come across the disease process in these tiny fragments especially the diseases which are focal like tuberculosis we may come across a granuloma we may come across the metastatic deposits we may come across cluster of plasma cells in these because the plasma cells in myeloma they are not uniformly distributed in earlier cases so once we have got the refined biopsy it needs to be fixed so we fix it in 10% neutral buffered formalin which we are using for various other tissues the only thing is it should be neutralized by adding sodium acetate once we add the sodium acetate then there is, we don't find any pigment like the formalin pigment in the biopsy then we give a edta decalcification and finally we can do the ihc on such sections another fixative which is commonly used is b5 the disadvantage of the b5 is that it contains mercury chloride sodium acetate now the mercury chloride gives a yellow color so what we have to do is before we do the he staining we have to remove the mercury chloride now that is done by iodine and then iodine is removed and then we finally do the usual uh, processing of the tissue and finally we 
cut the sections. Now, decalcification can be carried out using a formic acid. That is what is usually commonly used all over. Acetic acid. Strong acids should be avoided, especially the nitric acid and sulfuric acid. So what is the best one? The best one is EDTA sodium salt. Disodium salt is best one. And we use 10 to 15% disodium EDTA. Now the decalcification time, we usually do at least overnight. That means roughly for about 18 to 24 hours. However, in biopsies from children, we can do it even for four hours. That is sufficient. And in stout persons where we feel that the bony trabeculae are going to be thick, we may do it even for two days and sometimes even for three days. Now, EDTA is a relatively slow acting decalcifying agent, but it is uh, very good in the sense that it gives excellent immunostains. That means the antigens are not la lost from the, if we do with the EDTA decalcification. While this loss of antigens occurs, if we do HNO3 or we do uh, sulfuric acid uh, <clears throat> decalcification. Moreover, this tissue or the block can be used for good quality DNA whenever we need PCR or we need fish and we have got only the block of the case. So that is the best one. So EDT decalcification should be carried out. Now staining of the sections, we usually do HNE as all of us do. Sometimes we do a Ginza stain. Reticulin should be carried out in biopsies, especially whenever we feel that the reticulin is increased or there is a fibrosis of the marrow or there is collagenization. And then we can also do Masson's trichrome stain whenever we find that there is collagenization of the marrow has occurred, especially in various cases of primary myelofibrosis, metastatic deposits, and so on. Now, what is an adequate biopsy? Now, here we can see a very scanner view, long bone marrow biopsies. You can make out the marrow spaces and the bony trabeculae are seen. This section is from a child, you find there is a cartilage. Because in children, we come across that a major part of the biopsy length, a few millimeters to sometimes even one centimeter, there is cartilage. And then we find that the bony trabeculae are actually showing that the cartilage is getting converted into bone. And the marrow is very, very cellular in children, as you can see here. So this is a usual picture in a child's bone marrow to find biopsy. However, adequate biopsy is whenever we have a length of more than 1.5 centimeters or more than five intertrabecular spaces are seen. But the WHO recommends at least 10 intertrabecular spaces. For a few years in 90s, some people started doing uh, two bone marrow biopsies on either side, especially from cases of uh, lymphomas to see if the biopsy is involved or not. But with the PET CT coming in now, by and large, it is a unilateral bone marrow biopsy, which is carried out. Sometimes we find that the biopsy is small, one centimeter, 1.5 centimeters, but turns out to be adequate because we can see the lesion. That means we can see the sheets of plasma cells or the sheets of blast cells or the granulomas or metastasis or lymphoma deposit. So that suffices. However, biopsy should at least be more than 1.5 centimeters. Now, this is the normal biopsy. What we come across, as you can see on the left side, this green arrow is pointing at the periosteum. Then we have a thick bony trabecula, that is the cortex. And then we have marrow, again the bony trabeculae. Now, the bony trabeculae are parallel to each other. And what we are finding in between is the bone marrow, which is being seen. And this is the periosteum. If you look at the bony trabecula, <clears throat> This bony trabecula also shows some nuclei. Now, these are the osteocytes which are present in the lacuna, and these are all normal. In a good section, we will come across some osteoblasts are lining the bony trabecula, which is again normal. So what I'm going to talk about today is what are the indications of aspirate and biopsy. Then we'll go on to the scanner, dopar, hyper, and oil immersion view. Then discuss the cellularity of the bone marrow. Then the three series, erythro, myelo, and thrombopoiesis. 
then the other cells macrophage plasma cells mast cells and then in the biopsy how do we assess the reticulins how do we look for the granulomas meds and finally the osteopathies so today we'll do up to thrombopoiesis now indications for the bone marrow aspirate all of us are aware of in the various red cell disorders like megaloblastic anemia prca or any case of anemia which is not responding uh, to the therapy white cell disorders especially the aleukemic leukemia and subleukemic leukemias thrombocytopenias and now we also do for uh, thrombocytosis especially to diagnose cases of et various myeloproliferative neoplasms and lymphoproliferative disorders those <laughs> disorders like this neiman pigs and nowadays hlh we know that hlh is uh, a fatal condition if not treated or diagnosed properly multiple myelomas and various gamma pathies iron stores meds fungal diseases then the bone marrow failure states now this is something very very important in clinical practice every day we come across cytopenias single bicytopenias or pancytopenias and of course then in bone marrow transplantation cases now what picture you can see here on the left is an ideal bone marrow aspirate where we find that there are these bone marrow fragments and then these bone marrow fragments while making the smears have made nice trails you can make out the morphology and this is the area where you can do a differential count cellularity and the morphology of the cells is very well made up but every time we are not fortunate and then we come across a diluted marrow as you can see on its right you can see the marrow cells myeloma erythroblasts are seen but it is diluted so whatever blast cells we are telling say if i say 5% blast cell actually it might be 10% 15% so therefore this dilution of the marrow could be procedural or it could be a disease process which is affecting the bone marrow that means suppose there is fibrosis of the marrow or there is necrosis of the marrow we may not get a good bone marrow aspirate because of the fibrosis or aplasia of the marrow as in aplastic anemia so in all such conditions what we need is bone marrow biopsy so when is a bone marrow biopsy indicated whenever it is a diluted unsatisfactory marrow aspirate no marrow fragments due to aplasia or fibrosis of the marrow sometimes we find the disease is focal as the lymphoma deposits could be disease may be in the bony mass or it could be a faulty technique so the indications of the bone marrow biopsy are bone marrow failure syndromes which we will include mds and hypoplastic acute leukemias various causes of my marrow fibrosis undergraduates we used to teach them as myelofibrosis but we know now the marrow fibrosis can be seen in acute leukemias chronic leukemias hairy cell leukemias myelomas and so on then myeloproliferative neoplasms acute leukemias now we know that myeloproliferative neoplasms WHO has said clearly that the bone marrow trifine biopsy findings are specific and for each disease those are findings have to be kept in mind before diagnosing a case as myeloproliferative neoplasms so bone marrow biopsy is essential for diagnosis of aplastic marrow mets myeloproliferative neoplasms mds hodgkins disease nhl multiple myeloma and then various causes of suspected marrow fibrosis so how do we start looking at a aspirate or a biopsy first we look at the scanner then low par and then high par and finally we go on to the oil immersion now this is a scanner view of a bone marrow biopsy what we find the pink ones are the bony trabeculae fat and then there are areas where it is marrow is present now what we can make out here is that the cellularity is not uniform the top part is more cellular as compared to the lower part which appears as if it is a case of aplastic anemia and that is what is the need of an adequate bone marrow biopsy to give the clinician exact idea how much cellularity is there again a bone marrow aspirate showing us the hypercellular fragments so this is a scanner view it gives us a good idea that these marrow fragments are very very cellular similarly in the bone marrow trifine biopsy again we find that there is a, it is heterogeneous cellularity 
you find the upper part is sort of okay with about 65 to 70% cellularity but this part the lower part where the arrow is you find it is very very hypercellular so there is something wrong over here and actually it turned out to be a case of nhl over here then in low power we are able to see the normal bone marrow architecture now this is where the advantage of the bone marrow biopsy is which is not seen in bone marrow aspirate because all the cells get mixed up so what do we find bony trabecular megakaryocytes now these megakaryocytes are away from the bony trabecular so these are in the central part of the marrow here you have the erythroid precursors and these erythroid precursors are in the central part of the marrow so what do you find in the paratrabecular area in the paratrabecular area mainly the myeloid precursors are present of course you will find them all over the marrow but that is where they are concentrated and that is where the myelopoiesis occurs so this is to show you the topography these are the myeloblasts and promyelocytes which are present in the paratrabecular region and then here the mature and then you find the neutrophils polymorphs which are being formed over here the sites are in the central part of the marrow now in the central part again away from the bony trabecula you are finding these dot like structures these are all round but some are small some are slightly large here they are still larger so these are the erythroid precursors these are normoblasts maybe megaloblasts so these are the colonies of erythroid precursor so usually in a good bone marrow trifying biopsy we are able to see the colonies of uh, erythroid precursors then <clears throat> on a low power here we find that the architecture of the marrow is disturbed it is not a normal architecture as i have shown you earlier here we find number one the cellularity is different there are two areas which are similar but they are not uh, as per the normal marrow what we are seeing here here we find the background there is a gelatinous marrow transformation cellularity is different in different areas similarly here we find in another biopsy you are finding a megakaryocyte and then you are finding that all these cells are arranged in rows and then you are finding there are some plasma cells which are there again disturbing the bone marrow architecture so we have to look at the architecture of the bone marrow in a trifying biopsy again on a low power biopsy low power view what we are finding is megakaryocytic hyperplasia it is very very obvious so many megakaryocytes you are able to see in one field and of course the myeloid erythroid cells are very well made out at high power view we can see the details of the cell and make out yes it is myelocyte this is a metamyelocyte this is a band form this is a neutrophil these are the erythroid precursors late normoblasts these are the intermediate normoblasts and then you have the early normoblasts and then you find that here you find a megakaryocyte which has got uh, four or five nuclei it is a multi nucleated megakaryocyte which we find in mds now here again on low power in a trifying biopsy what we are able to see is these are all megakaryocytes this is a focus of proliferating megakaryocytes and then they are in paratrabecular location now this is abnormal location for the megakaryocytes so the by location is in the central part of the marrow so that is what makes the difference so that means we have already seen that there is something wrong it could be a case of primary myelofibrosis it could be a case of cml so a high power view the morphology and the topography of the uh, cells is very well made out and finally we go on to the oil immersion now this is the oil immersion picture so what we find here look at these cells where the arrow is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 now these are blast cells you can make out the nuclei also very well and so it could be a case of mds could be a case of acute leukemia here we find two megakaryocytes one of them is binucleated and a smaller one this is a micro megakaryocyte by nucleated one so probably we are dealing with a case of mds along with increased blast what we call as refractory anemia with excess of blast now oil immersion is also we are using in a trifying biopsy also now this is a trifying biopsy and it was suspected case of uh, kalazar we found that there were increased plasma cells and then in the macrophages you can see dot like structures 
Now, all these dot like structures are LD products. Of course, we have to differentiate them from uh, histoplasma, and we'll show you when we come to the infections. Now, after the scanner, low power, high power oil immersion view, we go on to the cellularity of the bone marrow. Now, this is uh, bone marrow aspirate. So, here what we have to see is the ratio of fat to the cells. See here also what we find is the fat is much more and there are hardly any cells in between. Here the cellularity is about 5% only. So very low cellularity could be a case of aplastic anemia. This could be a case, again here the fat is more. This could be from an old person. And if it is from a young person of a 20 year old, then it is a hypoplastic marrow. But we have to keep in mind, number one, that in adults, especially after the age of 30, there is periosteum at the top, this is cortex, and then this is subcortical marrow. Subcortical hypoplasia of the marrow is physiological. So that means up to five, six, we have seen a up to eight marrow spaces can show us only fat. And beyond that, we find that there are those uh, marrow uh, is normal. So that is a subcortical hypoplasia, which is physiological. Suppose I have a biopsy of only four marrow spaces to the subcortical and they're not showing any cellularity. So I should be very, uh, very, very careful to report it as either aplastic anemia or it is subcortical hypoplasia or not. Then we have to keep in mind the cellularity of the bone marrow. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we find in a one-year-old child, Cellularity is nearly 100% and cellularity gradually keeps on decreasing. At the age of about uh, 60 and beyond, we may come across a cellularity of about 25 to 30% only. So a 25 to 30% cellularity for a 70-year person is okay. But for a uh, child, for a young adult, no, it is not. It is indication of a hypoplastic marrow. Now, this is, these are the two fat fragment, uh, fragments of the bone marrow. In the left one, you find mainly fat. In between, you're finding lymphocytes and plasma. Right one is more cellular. And this is from an old person. It is more cellular with a cellularity of about 20 to 30 percent. But we don't report cellularity on a bone marrow aspirate. We just say hypocellular, taking the age of the person into consideration. So here it is hypoplastic. This is actually from an aplastic anemia case. However, this is from an uh, old person. And here we find that not only lymphocytes plasma cells, but you're able to make out the polymorphs, erythroblasts, some megakerocytes are also seen. So this is a normal marrow from an old person. Now this of course is a hypercellular marrow for a young person because the celerity is much more. And of course, here it is very, very cellular marrow with about uh, uh, very, very high cellularity, but the cell trails you can make out. Similarly, on a bone marrow trifine biopsy, we can give an exact cellularity of the bone marrow because that helps us in deciding whether we are dealing with a case of aplastic anemia or not. On the left one is a cellularity which is less than 5%. Here you find, here we always give how much is the cellularity by considering the marrow ratio to the fat. Here we find a 15 to 20% cellularity. Here it is about 65. And here you find 90, 95% cellularity is seen. So depending upon the age, uh, this we say hypercellular, normal cellular, or hypocellular marrow. While talking of the cellularity, the common marrow failure states are aplastic, Fanconi anemia, PNH, hypoplastic MDS, and also hypoplastic acute leukemia. Now here the section is showing us a hypoplastic marrow with a 10 to 15% cellularity. But if we don't examine under high power, we may miss the blast cells. So we may miss hypoplastic acute leukemia. We may even miss hypoplastic MDS also. So this is a hypocellular marrow, mainly fat, lymphocytes, plasma cells. This is a biopsy, again, less than 5% cellularity. So what cells are these? You can see there are many 
or majority of them are plasma cells there are lymphocytes and there are some mast cells present so we are dealing with a case of aplastic anemia you are finding a lack of myelopoiesis erythropoiesis and of course the megakaryocytes are the first to disappear from the bone marrow so the megakaryocytes are also not seen in this field but keep in mind that even in aplastic anemia a person has got a hemoglobin of 4 grams tlc of uh, 1000 platelets of 20000 now all those cells are coming from some marrow hemopoiesis which is taking place now this is one bone marrow biopsy a long bone marrow biopsy i have uh, given you the scanner view of this long uh, whole biopsy what we find is mainly a cellular marrow here again it is mainly a cellular marrow but with foci of hemopoiesis while in this one there are these hot spots we call them which are seen in an aplastic marrow there are foci of hemopoiesis mainly erythropoiesis very few myelopoiesis and again lack of megakaryocyte so an adequate bone marrow biopsy is essential number one to differentiate between aplastic anemia and subcortical hypoplasia and second for an exact diagnosis of cellularity and hence aplastic anemia then whenever we talk of the cellularity and uh, aplasia then we do the differential what we find is we count all the cells 500 cells are counted so what we find here the erythroid cells are missing megakaryocytes were there myeloid cells are plenty but the erythroid cells are missing similarly in the trifine biopsy what we are finding are myeloid cells megakaryocytes erythroid precursors are missing are we dealing with a case of pure red cell aplasia or prca see we keep on teaching our undergraduates that the aplastic crisis occurs in hereditary spherocytosis it may occur in sickle cell disease but the more common causes which we come across in clinical practice are infections viral bacterial fungal tuberculosis all sorts of infections can lead to pure red cell aplasia some of the drugs thymomas in adults some of the neoplasms then immunoglobulin inhibitors and then it could be idiopathic pure red cell aplasia also one of the viral diseases which give rise to pure red cell aplasia is parvo virus b19 and what we find in these cases is that the erythroid precursors are not there but what we are finding are giant pro erythroblasts now these giant erythroblasts are diagnostic of pure red cell aplasia due to parvo virus b19 here we find the cytoplasm is basophilic and then you find big inclusion like nucleoli are seen this prca due to b19 could be transient red cell aplasia or it could be a chronic prca even in hereditary spherocytosis or hemolytic anemia this transient red cell aplasia can occur due to parvo virus b19 <coughs> now this a typical uh, giant erythroblast basophilic cytoplasm cytoplasmic protrusions like uh, dog's ears and the same can be made out in a trifine biopsy what we find in trifine biopsy large cell it has got the same inclusion like huge nucleolus in this one as well as in this one and an eosinophilic cytoplasm of parvovirus b19 infection then we go on to the erythropoiesis now in erythropoiesis what we can see here in aspirate and biopsy there are these uh, colonies of erythroid precursors <coughs> and what we can make out are the early erythroid precursors early erythroblasts lots of uh, intermediate erythroblasts and then you have these pycnotic nuclei these are the late erythroblasts now on a trifine biopsy again we are seeing this early erythroblasts early and intermediate and here the most of them are late what we find is that around each late erythroblast there is a clear space now these clear spaces are seen in the cells of the erythroid cells around the late erythroblast around the intermediate erythroblast and sometimes also around the early erythroblast now this helps us in differentiating these erythroblasts from lymphocytes for a beginner there may be a problem that are we dealing with the case uh, are these all lymphocytes or these are all erythroblasts so this space around these cells helps us in distinguishing one from the other 
then we find is that the early normoblasts are few intermediate are many more and the late are maximum roughly the ratio is 1 is to 2 is to 4 because the earlier normoblasts they keep on multiplying intermediate because this division can occur up to intermediate normoblasts late normoblasts they do not multiply but the as they multiply and then they mature and that is why the late normoblasts are more now this is a normal normoblastic reaction in a case early erythroblasts intermediate erythroblasts and then we have this late erythroblasts which are seen so the morphology is very very important 1 is 2 is to 4 is the maturation this is a normoblastic hyperplasia on a bone marrow defined biopsy and what you can see is again space around most of these erythroblasts to distinguish them from lymphocytes <coughs> then there is a micro normoblastic reaction which is seen in iron deficiency anemia because whenever we report a bone marrow uh, aspirate or biopsy we say uh, the reaction is normoblastic micro normoblastic or megaloblastic so normoblastic we have seen here we find that these erythroblasts are smaller they are showing persistent basophilia on gimsa stain and there is fraying of the cytoplasmic borders similarly here you are not uh, you are able to see that this erythropoiesis the irregularity of the nuclei is seen and then these are the late erythroblasts with the pycnotic nuclei and these are smaller so micronormoblastic that is a feature of iron deficiency anemia but we can confirm it by doing an iron stain now this is a case where we find again the similar erythroblasts the late ones and then you are finding these are megaloblasts these are large they have got a sieve like uh, chromatin pattern early most of them are early erythroblasts so that means we are dealing with a case of dimorphic anemia due to deficiency of iron uh, b12 and or folate now this is a megaloblastic anemia now what has happened here is <clears throat> majority of the cells are all uh, early erythroblasts with basophilic cytoplasm and sieve like uh, chromatin that is because of the fact that the maturation here is early normoblasts are maximum because some of them undergo apoptosis then some of them mature to intermediate normoblasts then they undergo apoptosis so the late normoblasts are very few very few late normoblasts are seen that is why the red cells are few that is why the patient has got anemia though the marrow is so hyperplastic so in megaloblastic anemia the maturation becomes 8 is to 2 is to 1 or 4 is to 2 is to 1 it reverses and there is preponderance of early megaloblasts same on the defined bone marrow biopsy what we are finding is they appear like blast cells but you look at the nucleoli nuclear chromatin is open and you find that these are multiple nucleoli and these nucleoli are longitudinal and these longitudinal nucleoli are touching the nuclear membrane now that is a characteristic feature of megaloblast and then you find very frequent mitosis this is one mitosis this is another mitosis frequent mitosis preponderance of these early megaloblasts the intermediate and the late are hardly any again this is a feature of megaloblastic anemia on a bone marrow defined biopsy but for a beginner there could be a problem in differentiating these early megaloblasts from blast cells so we should be very careful when we are dealing with early megaloblasts if you have got an imprint smear or a bone marrow aspirate smear that will help you in learning that these are megaloblasts and not the blast cells then we have to see whether in erythroblasts the nuclei are round or any cytoplasmic or nuclear manifestation if there is this erythropoiesis now what we finding here is that these are two late megaloblasts the nuclei are not round irregularity of the nuclear chromatin though the chromatin is open sieve like similarly here you are finding sort of a budding or an incomplete mitosis which has occurred the cytoplasmic borders are also not round so these are the features of dysethropoiesis so this is the morphological manifestation of dysethropoiesis now such cells have got very short life they mature into abnormal cells so they don't live for 100 to 120 days so shortened life span since they die in the marrow very early 
so the LTH is increased and the serum bilirubin is increased. Since they die very early, so that is the hemolytic component of a case of megaloblastic anemia. And their <coughs> bilirubin, especially the indirect bilirubin, is increased. Other features of dyserythropoiesis, like here you find there is basophilic stippling, nuclear budding, here both again multiple basophilic stippling, irregular borders of the nuclei. Then you come across these myelite cells also show features of giant band forms or giant metamyelocyte. And then of course, this is a typical sieve-like chromatin which we come across in these early and intermediate megaloblasts. This is a giant band forms. So all the features you will be able to see in a case of megaloblastic anemia. And this is a late megaloblast. Again, the nucleochromatin is not pycnotic, but it's slightly more open. While talking of the dyserythropoiesis, there, are th uh, there is one condition which we may come across, not very often, that is congenital dyserythropoietic anemia, CDA, which is classified into three types, CDA1, CDA2, CDA3. Of course, now there are six, seven types of CDAs, but the, these three are uh, more common. In CDA1, we find that the erythroblasts, they are binucleated, but the, it is joined by a thin chromatin bar. So this is CDA1 when we find dumbbell-shaped nuclei. If we find binucleated, this is one binucleated erythroblast. This is another binucleated erythroblast. So if we find majority of these abnormal erythroblasts are binucleated, and that is CDA type 2. And then we have CDA type 3, in which you find gigantoblasts. You find huge cells, and these will show us uh, more than four nuclei are seen. So CDA type 3, CDA type CDA type 2 is more common than CDA 1 and CDA 3. Erythropoiesis is incomplete unless we report on the bone marrow iron. Here you can see even on uh, Jimsa stain, golden brown pigment in the macrophages because it is uh, markedly increased in this case of thalassemia major. So this golden brown pigment is seen. You do the pearl stain and then you can report on the bone marrow iron. But where should we report the bone marrow iron? Bone marrow fragments are essential. What I told you are that these are the bone marrow fragments. These are the bone marrow fragments. So the iron has to be reported in this bone marrow fragment only, not in the surrounding area where there are no bone marrow fragments. So only bone marrow fragments have to be taken into account when we are talking about the bone marrow iron. Now here we find iron grade zero. There is no blue pigment at all. So this is grade zero which is seen in iron deficiency anemia. This is iron grade one where we find few macrophages are showing us the iron. And then we have the grade two where many more macrophages show. In grade three it is both intracellular as well as extracellular and up to grade three <coughs> as normal iron. Four, five is increased. You can see here on grade four, the iron is increased. Five, you can uh, even on a scanner view, and even in grade four, you can make out that these fragments are containing iron. If the iron is present here all around, that should not be taken into consideration because it could be a staining problem. It could be a contaminated water. So we should report only iron in the bone marrow fragments. And then of course, this is iron grade six, same case you are seeing. And here iron is so much that we are not able to make out the morphology of the fragments uh, of the marrow cells at the back of this iron pigment. Then whenever we find that the iron stores are grade three to four to five, we should look for if there, uh, uh, there are ring sideroblasts present or not or if there are abnormal uh, sideroblasts. Now, abnormal sideroblasts are when we find that the pinhead type of granules are seen in the erythroblast. Like this is a megaloblast, and here you find these two dots. These are abnormal sideroblasts. Here you are finding multiple iron granules around the nucleus. This is a ring sideroblast, and the ring sideroblast are the feature of sideroblastic anemia. Rarely we may come across whenever the iron stores are increased, that even in the red cells, 
we may find some of these containing iron granules, what we call as sidrocytes. Now that was about the bone marrow aspirate. Then we can do the iron grading on the bone marrow biopsy also. Here the grading is from zero to grade four. Up to one we take as normal. Grade zero is nil, two, three, four. But the problem with the biopsy is that we usually don't report iron unless it is increased. Because whenever we are fixing them in formalin, the, there is leaching of iron from by formalin. As a result, whatever we are reporting, it, that is not accurate. And therefore, if we really want to report on bone marrow defined biopsy, then we should fix it in <clears throat> Zanker's fluid because with the mercury being around, we find that the, there is no leaching of iron because there is no formalin. So by and large, we report iron on the bone marrow aspirate. Sometimes we come across, we are looking for iron, but we, what we are seeing is a dark brown uh, pigmented granules, which are seen, and these are the macrophages containing them. This is the malarial pigment on the bone marrow aspirate. And each dot is corresponding to one plasmodium falciparum gametocyte. And this is on trifine biopsy. You are seeing this brown pigment. It does not take iron. And it can only be bleached with alcoholic picric acid. After erythropoiesis, we go on to the myelopoiesis. Now, in myelopoiesis, what we are looking for is actually, number one, blast cells, promyelocytes, myelocytes, their granules, band forms, metamyelocyte, and the neutrophils, metamyelocyte and the neutrophils. So here we find that the maturation from promyelocytes onwards to the neutrophils is taking place. Of course, we count whether it is myelocyte, promyelocytes, how many of them are there. Look at this one. Here we find that the majority of the cells are promyelocytes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There is hardly any myelo, meta, and polymorphs. So what we call it, there is a maturation arrest in this particular case. And that could be the cause of neutropenia in a particular case. So therefore, the counting of these cells is very, very important. Sometimes we find the maturation arrest occurring at promyelocyte stage. Sometimes even at myelocyte stage, we find the maturation uh, arrest is occurring. This is on a bone marrow trifine biopsy. Here we find myeloid hyperplasia. You can see these sheets of myeloid cells. There are many more as compared to the erythroid precursors. You are finding very few erythroid precursors, majority of them, and then majority of them are mature. We call it as a reactive marrow or myeloid hyperplasia. Here we find that these polymorphs and metamyelocytes, what we are finding are majority of the cells are having oval nuclei. So though the granules we cannot make out in them, but those could be myelocytes or promyelocytes. And then we confirm by looking at the smear whether the maturation arrest is occurring at the promyelocyte stage or at myelocyte stage. And then we have sometimes eosinophilia. Here you are finding majority of the cells of the myeloid series are eosinophils. So we have to look into the various causes of eosinophilia if we are dealing with a neoplastic disorder or we are dealing with hyper eosinophilic syndrome or it may be just a reactive eosinophilia due to some worm infestation or a skin disorder. Whenever we have uh, older people, bone marrow aspirate done, we always look for if there is any dysmyelopoiesis to report as a case of MDS. What we find here, you can see here the two uh, metamyelocytes, their nuclear borders are not the usual ones. Rather, you are finding abnormal shapes of these metamyelocytes. Here you find a ring neutrophil which is present. Sometimes you may come across that the granules in the neutrophils are very few, in the metamyelocytes are few. All these are features which are suggestive of MDS. So we look for features of uh, dysmyelopoiesis in the myeloid series of cells. Here you find sheets of eosinophils. This is a case of chronic eosinophilic leukemia. So of course it has to be confirmed with uh, various uh, cytogenetic and uh, molecular markers. Lymphocytosis of the bone marrow. Look here. Now here you are finding these lymphocytes and these are the late normoblasts. See, the late normoblasts have got a very pyknotic nuclei 
lymphocytes have comparatively slightly more open then you find that there is hardly any cytoplasm in these lymphocytes when here the late thromboblasts are like red cells containing a nucleus so that is how you differentiate between a lymphocyte and a late normoblast but here of course you are finding a lymphocytosis of the bone marrow could be a case of cll if it is an adder in a defined biopsy again you are finding that here you are finding these myeloid precursors erythroid precursors but here these are all lymphocytes they are gathered together forming what we call as lymphoid nodule or a lymphoid aggregate sometimes we may find even germinal center in these lymphoid aggregates and the benign lymphoid aggregates are seen in bone marrows of old people here you are finding again the lymphocytes are increased but it is interstitial increase there is no aggregate now this could be a case of monoclonal b lymphocytosis or it could be a mild infection resulting in lymphocytosis on the other hand if we look at this bone marrow biopsy you are finding two big nodules and the third one has not come into the picture this was a case of cll in which you will find that the nodular deposits of the cll cells is seen then we after myelopoiesis we go on to uh, megakaryopoiesis now megakaryopoiesis we know it takes place uh, under the influence of thrombopoietin gata1 fog1 and fly1 and here it is a endomitotic cell cycle as a result of which we find the nuclei become 4n 8n or 16n and the nucleus becomes polyploid and here you find that the cytoplasm then becomes pinkish because of the appearance of the azerophilic granules and then the budding starts taking place from these megakaryocytes and then what happens is that these are the platelets which are being formed and then once all the platelets of the cytoplasm has given out the platelets what is left is a naked nuclei and that undergoes apoptosis now we all know that uh, starts the process with a megakaryoblast and then you find the cytoplasm is basophilic and then comes pro megakaryocyte the azerophilic granules start appearing and the nuclear division continues more and more cytoplasm becomes pinkish due to granules and then we find that the platelets are formed as from this granular cytoplasm now this is to show you a pro megakaryocyte with a basophilic cytoplasm part of cytoplasm has become pinkish here again the part has become here the total is pinkish and it is granular cytoplasm this is on a bone marrow defined biopsy we find megakaryocyte in the central part of the marrow here these are all normal megakaryocytes and uh, this is a case of itp where you are finding this megakaryocytic proliferation then there could be dwarf megakaryocytes there could be giant megakaryocytes dysplastic megakaryocytes megakaryocytes with bulbous and cloud like nuclei the very presence of such megakaryocytes is diagnostic of many diseases i'll just demonstrate to you uh, yes these are normal megakaryocytes both on aspirate and biopsy normal size here we find the megakaryocytes are huge on an aspirate and multilobated more than the usual one here we find that not only the megakaryocytes are large giant megakaryocytes again the multilobation is much more now this is a case of et another feature is that there is a loose clustering of megakaryocytes they are with each other they are lying very close but in between some hemopoietic cells are coming so loose clusters giant megakaryocytes here inside the cytoplasm of a megakaryocyte you are seeing a cell this is empyreopolysis by the megakaryocyte now these are dwarf megakaryocytes so you can see these are small ones the nuclei are hypolobated one similarly this is on a bone marrow trifine biopsy you are finding multiple dwarf small megakaryocytes with hypolobated these are characteristic feature is which is seen in cml and some myeloproliferative disorders again the dwarf megakaryocytes but they should always be distinguished from micro megakaryocyte now the micro megakaryocytes is a feature of mds dwarf megakaryocytes are smaller hypolobated nuclei 
So the micro are even smaller than the dwarf megakaryocytes. And here you find the cytoplasm matures and the platelets are formed. Here, usually the platelets are not formed from these cells and they appear sort of blastoid. This is a binucleated micromegakaryocyte. This is again to show you the micromegakaryocytes where you find non-lobated or bilobated nuclei. And this is a feature of dysplasia. This is on a bone marrow trephine biopsy. This is on bone marrow aspirate. Then we come across megakaryocytes, as you can see here, with multiple nuclei. But these are wide apart from each other. This is a multinucleated megakaryocytes. And this is, again, a feature of MDS. Now, this is the one where it is a bare nucleus or a naked nucleus of a megakaryocyte, which is seen at the end of the mega, uh, thrombopoiesis. And these are seen in more so in cases of HIV infection. Then we find that all shapes and sizes of megakaryocytes are seen in primary myelofibrosis. As you can see here, one, two, three, four. These are the uh, bulbous nuclei which are seen. These are the multinucleated megakaryocytes. Here again, a bulbous nucleus is seen. Some multilobation is there. And all shapes and sizes of megakaryocytes are present. This is seen. Very, very dysplastic megakaryocytes are seen in primary myelofibrosis. Then going to the uh, position of the megakaryocytes, normally they are in the central part of the marrow. But once they become paratrabecular, it is abnormal, which is again seen in primary myelofibrosis. Then lastly, what are we reporting on the bone marrow aspirate report? Number one, does it have marrow particles? Is it particulate or aparticulate? If it is aparticulate, usually it is hemodiluted. Then whether the particle trails are cellular or not, because that is the area where we are going to do the differential count. Cellularity of the fragment, erythropoiesis, as I told you, the reaction, normoblastic, micronormoblastic, megaloblastic. Myelopoiesis is the maturation normal up to neutrophils, or there is a maturation arrest, or what is the morphology? Are there dysplastic uh, myelopoiesis? Megakaryopoiesis, are they normal size, dwarf, giant megakaryocytes, multiple sized megakaryocytes, and then Clusters, are they in clusters or they are lying discrete because clusters is a feature of uh, is a feature of uh, ET and various other myeloproliferative disorders. Blast cells, their number, because that is how we will diagnose MDS. Plasma cells are then increased. Macrophages, parasites, whether malarial, LD bodies, any fungus, metastatic cells. Is there any gelatinous marrow transformation? Is there any bone marrow necrosis? Iron stain, that we must report on each and every case. And finally, we give a conclusion. What is, whether it is an iron deficiency anemia, whether it is a megaloblastic anemia, what do we advise in a particular case, whether serum folic acid, B12, or serum iron? Comment that should we do a bone marrow biopsy? If already done, then combine with cytogenetics, if it is a safe, MDS, say 5Q deletion, molecular studies, all those we should advise. And then finally, we should combine all the reports of peripheral smear, bone marrow aspirate, bone marrow biopsy, cytogenetics, and molecular studies so that the clinician can treat the case. There are some problems in bone marrow interpretation, like improperly made smears, diluted marrow, suboptimal fixation, poor staining. Sometimes the marrow clots immediately, we are not able to make good bone marrow aspirate. Then bone marrow should be collected in EDTA. If we make the smears after a long time, then the morphology is distorted. Whenever we are reporting iron stain, we should have at least seven particles. Take an average, some may be of grade two, some may be of grade three, some may be of grade four, give an average. Sometimes we are not aware of a disease. If you're not aware of a disease, we may miss some findings or we may not report it because it could be sampling error also. Now, what is going to happen in future? Some of the images will be analyzed by artificial intelligence so that artificial intelligence will interpret and give the diagnosis. Then what is going to happen? A person like me, de-skilling of hematologists, see, the skill will be gone. And then 
we don't know whether artificial intelligence will be able to report or give a misdiagnosis or a correct diagnosis however as far as peripheral smears are concerned artificial intelligence has been able to pick up the various uh, disorders wherever the morphology of neutrophils monocytes is normal and thank you so much for your attention this is the second edition of my book this is for md dnb practical pathology examination where i have put in my efforts of and experience of examination along with my colleagues dr geeta jairam who has done a wonderful job for cytology dr neeta khurana she is a histopathologist and neha singh is in aims rishikesh thank you very much and i must thank dr mishra Dr. Santi, Dr. Vatsala Mishra, for giving me an opportunity to give you and to share my experiences with you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for that wonderful presentation, and it was really nice that you touched upon the fundamentals and basics of performing bone marrow aspirates and biopsies, and then sequentially you discussed about the interpretation of them and the finally the reporting part. Uh, now i open the session to uh, discussion in case any of the attendees wants to ask uh, any questions uh, they are welcome you can clarify your doubts uh, there is one question by someone uh, okay. dr ramesh wadwan wadwani he has asked what is the cause of bone marrow clotting immediately bone marrow clotting clotting okay see the cause of bone marrow clotting is because after all uh, there is uh, blood and there are clotting factors and whenever it touches the slide the glass slide that surface is a uh, rough surface so the clotting occurs immediately so that is why taking bone marrow aspirate is one skill and then immediately making the smears is another skill so you make the smears as early as possible so that the clotting does not occur in case clotting has occurred pick up all the clots put in formalin and use it as a bone marrow trifine biopsy so those will show you the blood clot with entangled take thin sections you can make out the morphology of the cell uh the second question is by dr aisharya basu who has asked how can we calculate the percentage of cellularity see uh this is more of a subjective thing but if you have been doing bone marrow trifine biopsies because the percentage we report on bone marrow trifine biopsies only and if suppose we come across 50% fat and 50% cellular areas now this is because i have been seeing say for more than 40 years but we can also use a grid to come because uh, initially that will have be a great help you put in a grid into the ips and those small squares we can count that small squares fat is 40 and the cells are 60 so you, it gives you an idea that 60% cellularity looks like this 50% cellularity looks like this once you have seen about um, 100 bone marrow biopsies it will become easy i on my own i do it now objective now i just assess that so much is the fat and so much on us i just uh, want to add what uh, professor tejinder singh uh, has said normally we do the eyeballing so by okay. the eyeballing uh, we calculate the we estimate the uh, degree of cellularity for age but these mm -hmm. in addition to those manual morphometry what sir has said about the grid system we have mm -hmm. digital morphometry available you can scan the entire slide and now okay. there are digital algorithms which will calculate the cellular and cellular areas and can give you the exact objective cellularity that's also is in use currently in the west and the yes better on more accurate yes correct that will be more accurate cellularity yes so third question is what is the normal count for megakaryocytes in a uh, bone marrow aspirate smears see in a low power smear if we are examining under low power we should be able to see 
two to four megakaryocytes, provided it is a fragment or very close to the fragment. Because in between the fragments, we may not come across as many megakaryocytes as we come across in the marrow fragments or just next to the marrow fragments. Yes, thank you. Any other question by the attendees? I think we are coming to the end of this session. So no, just no, one, so one question. Yes. Dr. You, Mishra, there are so many charts in charts that they, they have asked so many questions. Please. Uh, I, I know, I know. I'm seeing in, those charts. In charts, yeah. Yes. Please yes. discuss. Sir, can I ask one question, sir? Yes, sure. Please, please, uh, so uh, you recommended first a trephine biopsy followed by an aspiration. Yes. Uh, the If you go through the Jamshidi and Westerman Jensen's original articles of 60s, they have said that first of all, we should do the trephine biopsy because trephine biopsy does not distort the architecture. You just take a piece of the bone marrow. If we do the aspirate first, you apply suction. As you apply suction, what happens is that the area, say in about in about 1.5 centimeters all around the needle, that gets sucked up. As a result, there is distortion of the marrow and there is hemorrhage. So if we now take a biopsy from that area, that will result in a distorted architecture. And sometimes you find only hemorrhage and very few marrow cells. Therefore, the bone marrow biopsy should be taken first, followed by bone marrow aspirate. But if you want to do bone marrow aspirate first, go ahead, take a aspirate, but then put in the needle at least 1.5 centimeters away from the puncture side of the bone marrow aspirate so that the architecture of the marrow will not be disturbed and, the, and there won't be any hemorrhage in that. So that part also you can do. Uh, the fourth question is by Dr. Shiva Yogi Sivangi Jain. How to differentiate erythroblast from myeloblast in bone marrow biopsy? That, uh, in that marrow I think we'll discuss in next class because Sarah will discuss blast in next class. Okay. okay. We'll do that in uh, next class. So there is uh, Partha Goswami who has asked what is the ideal practice in regard to approach a case of pancytopenia? Should bone marrow aspirate and biopsy be taken together? Yes, whenever we have a case of pancytopenia, of course, we have examined the peripheral blood, which has given us an idea whether it is going to be aplastic, but we are not able to make out could it be MDS or aplastic. It is a good practice to do both bone marrow aspirate and biopsy simultaneously and also put some marrow in heparin also in case we have to do flow cytometric analysis or any molecular markers. Yes, thank you. So the, la uh, the next question is by again, Dr. Sivangi, what is the size of a micro megakaryocyte? Size of a micro megakaryocyte is slightly bigger than a promyelocyte. Promyelocyte is a big cell. Uh, so this uh, micro megakaryocyte is slightly bigger than that, but it is uh, about uh, less than one third or half the size of a dwarf megakaryocyte. So the dwarf megakaryocyte should not be confused with micro megakaryocyte at all. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, the other question is by Dr. Deepika Mishra. Uh, she is asking, when can we tell a megakaryocyte is multinucleated? It should have how many nuclei? Nuclei. Yes. Even two nuclei is binucleated, multiple nuclei, multinucleated, but those nuclei should not be close to each other because after all, if we are taking a section, sometimes the chromatin bars which are connecting the various lobes, they may not come in the section and we may think that actually it is multinucleated, but it may not be. It may be a multilobated nuclei. Therefore, the WHO has clearly specified that the nuclei should be wide apart. However, in a in a bone marrow aspirate, this part is easily made out. If you are looking in the bone marrow biopsy, if you are finding multinucleated, you are also seeing multinucleated megakaryocytes in the bone marrow aspirate as well, where the nuclei are wide apart and usually such nuclei are near the periphery of the megakaryocyte rather than in the central part. 
Uh, yes. So now I have two more questions before we wind up this session and I hand it over to the organizers. The yes, last but one question is by Dr. Ramesh Wadwani again. Can mm -hmm. we perform bone marrow aspiration and biopsy in a patient having a platelet count less than 10,000? Yes, bone marrow aspirate and biopsy can be done provided that you watch the patient post uh, aspiration and biopsy at least for eight hours. And second thing is soon after do doing the bone marrow aspirate or biopsy, you should apply enough pressure for about half an hour so that the bleeding does not occur. If bleeding does not occur in half an hour, usually no bleeding occurs subsequently. But you must keep a watch for about eight hours. Yes. Uh, the last question uh, before we wind up uh, is by Dr. Prerna Chaudhary. She is asking how to comment on the overall cellularity if she is getting both hypocellular and hypercellular particles in a bone marrow aspirate. In a bone marrow aspirate, we do come across because sometimes we come across multiple fragments. Some of the fragments may be from subcortical hypoplasia, which will be showing only fat. Then we will come across areas, fragments, which are quite cellular. And those are the deeper thing. So what we do is on bone marrow aspirate, we tell the clinician that we are coming across both the types of fragments, hypocellular as well as uh, hypercellular. Hypocellular could be due to a subcortical physiological hypoplasia and the other ones are actually the fragments and their trails are cellular and then we tell them that the trails made by the hypercellular fragments are showing whatever the features are so clinician your clinician should be aware that you know what subcortical hypoplasia is and you are likely to see such fragments in adult population so once your clinician is tuned to it it becomes easy because i have not reported a one centimeter biopsy as a case of aplastic anemia. I always write down that it could be either of the two to be correlated with the peripheral smear, uh, CBC counts, reticulocyte count, all those factors have to be taken into account before we are sure that this is or label a case as aplastic anemia. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for this interesting discussion. I think, no, sir, today... Dr. Mistra, we have some um, some questions in chats. Can ah, you yes, see them? Chat, chat, I have already asked. I, I should asked. I read them? Yes, no, yes, yes. You have done that? Yes, yes. 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 Just, just, that just one start. minute, I'll see the uh, YouTube also. They have asked some questions. Just YouTube. Okay, I have not seen questions. I knew that there will be a lot of questions because this is a <laughs> matter of uh, hematology. And sir has uh, described it in so nice way. I one question it. from sir, one question from Jyoti Priyadarshini. Should bone marrow aspiration and uh, biopsy done in OPD or in OT? <laughs> done in the OPD. Uh, can yes. It can be done in OPD, it can be done even in pathology department, but <laughs> it is always better to have aseptic precautions and to have uh, various uh, drugs available at any point of time if the patient requires. So we have, I have never done in pathology department, I have never done in OPD. I have always done it in the ward or in a minor OT, which is usually a room next to the ward. Sir, one question from Manas Burela. Uh, yes. Is the space around erythrocytes always seen in biopsy? If so, why? Space around erythrocytes. It is a little bit of shrinkage artifact which leads to that space. The nucleus shrinks a little bit from the cytoplasm because the cytoplasm is hemoglobinized. It is unlike a cytoplasm of a blast cell or a lymphocyte in which there is no hemoglobin at all. So there is no shrinkage in those cells. It is only in the intermediate and late erythroblast, sometimes in early erythroblast, you'll find the nucleus shrinks a little bit, as a result of which you will find that there will be a space. In a good section, nicely fixed, stained, thin section, space is almost always made out. And Sir. it is easy to differentiate from the lymphocytes. Sir. Sir, from Dr. Pranav Kumar Bhattacharya, erythrophagocytosis in bone marrow aspirates, aspiration, may be indication of sepsis in ICU setup. 
he has given a statement absolutely i think uh, he is right and next time i'll be showing uh, pictures of uh, hemophagocytosis and how to go about diagnosing such cases of hlh very right yes yeah. sir so numerous uh, uh, numerous uh, this uh, attendees have uh, thanked you for the excellent presentation in youtube also okay <laughs> and dr pranab kumar bhattacharya also has given so many granuloma may be seen in disseminated tuberculosis so many yeah. has given those uh, will be covered when we and, uh, go ahead part two the various other cells will take a yes. mat granulomas infections skeletal etc will finish off as much as we can sir one question is there uh, afsan khan uh, yes. uh, how many micro microscopic fields to see scan for iron grading sir how many microscopic fields to scan for iron grading see what we when we are doing the staining we must examine whatever bone marrow smears we have got whether there are fragments or not if there are fragments pick up that slide only if you find only two or three fragments pick up two slides so that we have three plus three six fragments on an average we must examine five to seven fragments and in that calculate the amount of iron suppose there are will be grade 3 grade 3 then grade 4 grade 4 grade 4 grade 4 then we take an average that it is about grade 3 to 4 iron and that is increased up to grade 3 we take as normal grade 4 5 6 is increased iron so so many questions aishurya basu how can we calculate the percent of cellularity No, that has already been repeated. Already done. Yeah, already done. Yes. Repeated. I think we have gone through all the questions. Now I hand yes. it over back to you. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you so very many. much for uh, attendance. Number seven. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tejinder, for such a nice lecture. We were expecting lot of questions, and I think we have covered all the questions. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, I told them you blog and through YouTube. And yes, and I'll see how will they get the certificate. Yes, what to do? So I was getting WhatsApp uh, messages. Madam, we cannot log in because it says it is full. So <laughs> it was very nice presentation as expected. Very simple, very nice, and very basic things. Huh. And uh, here I will also like to ask, which is a very common day to day is. Uh, Question is by the clinicians that they uh, usually transfuse PRBCs to the aplastic anemia patients or hypoplastic and hypercytopenia patients, and then they send them for bone marrow as aspiration or biopsy. So should it be then, or should uh, there should be a gap, and what should be the gap between transfusion of uh, PRBCs and doing bone marrow aspiration and biopsy? This is very common questions they ask. it does not make any difference because the marrow whatever is going on in the marrow that is not affected by giving prbcs so they may send pre or they may send post doesn't matter advantage of sending pre is that the peripheral smear is not affected yes. by the yes otherwise yes. what happens is the peripheral smear gets affected we may not be able to report dimorphic oh, really? yes, yes so the morphic red cell that yes. is why Yes. So, preferable to have both peripheral smears and bone marrow pre-therapy or pre-transfusion. Yeah, that's why I tell. So again, very nice lecture. I would like uh, Dr. Mohanty for his comments. The senior member is there, or Dr. Parija. Uh, uh, Dr. Singh. Uh, yes. Sir. Just uh, uh, I am hearing a wonderful lecture from a mm -hmm. devoted person. So that's my <laughs> comment. You are a teacher for which you have given so a devoted right. man. Unless a devotion is there, such type of lecture is not possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. अपन अनम्यूट करी कौन तो अनम्यूट करों तो करना है तो अनम्यूट करेगी कौन तो. So comment from anyone, Ranjan. Parijas sir, unmute करों तो sir, please unmute करी कौन तो Parijas sir, if you want to speak. Sir. Ah, thank you. thank you thank you thank you dr singh very nice presentation